All right. So uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Cloud Online Meetup. Today's topic is High Performance MySQL in an OpenStack Cloud. And uh, we have three presenters today with us uh, from Percona. It's uh, Matt Griffith, it's uh, Tom Diedrich, and uh, George Locke. And um, we are able to discuss how Percona, which is an expert in high performance MySQL, is working with the community to address some of the key database challenges that exist with uh, operating OpenStack clouds. And uh, they will also share information about the upcoming OpenStack Live event, which is going to take place in April the 13th and 14th in Santa Clara, California, uh, which will feature tutorials and speakers on topics such as benchmarking, trough, real-world stories from enterprise users, and more. Uh, some logistics front up. If you have any questions, feel free to ask those in the chat window at the bottom of the uh, web panel. And this session is um, being recorded, and it will be available shortly after, as well as the presentation. All right, and uh, with that, let me hand over to today's speakers. Can you guys please introduce yourself and uh, tell us about uh, Percona? Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, my name is Matt Griffin. I'm a director of product management uh, here at uh, Percona. And uh, I'll introduce you all to George. Uh, George Lord is a uh, uh, lead software engineer with Percona. Uh, he's been uh, uh, directly involved with OpenStack uh, for the last uh, couple of releases. Uh, and then uh, Tom Dietrich, who is our community manager uh, here at Percona and uh, really managing our outreach to uh, the OpenStack community, but also other communities, as well as definitely the MySQL community for Percona. Um, so um, just to kind of cover some of the agenda, and I'll give you a little bit of background on Percona uh, in a second, but just to cover the agenda, as Raphael said, uh, we've been working with the OpenStack community to address some of the key database challenges that exist when operating OpenStack clouds. Uh, today we're going to cover how uh, we're making MySQL better for OpenStack and we're by focusing on these three areas. There are other areas we are uh, working uh, with the community and working with clients uh, on, but today I'm just going to focus on these three areas. Uh, in the future, uh, we'll have some upcoming talks uh, with this group. Um, we'll cover more areas uh, of how Percona is improving OpenStack for enterprise users, uh, but we're just going to focus on these three areas. First is MySQL guests in the cloud, so we're talking about databases as a service. Second is what we're doing for benchmarking uh, the MySQL core of OpenStack. And finally, how are we supporting the OpenStack community? And uh, how are we uh, helping to build bridges between MySQL and OpenStack? Um, not only what are we doing today from a development standpoint, but also what are we doing today from a uh, helping those that are operating public uh, and private uh, cloud infrastructure? Uh, and so, um, so a little bit about uh, Percona. Um, Percona has been around since 2006. Uh, our focus has always been on delivering high performance MySQL to our clients uh, and the community, definitely the community of database uh, users. Um, we, we do this through concentrating on, I guess, you could kind of say three core channels. Uh, one is our open source software, two is our services, and three is our community. Percona started as a uh, services focused company for MySQL and, as I said, for high performance MySQL. Uh, doing consulting and custom engagements for, for customers. As a result of that work, we have grown our flavor of MySQL called Percona Server. Um, it is 100% compatible with Oracle MySQL, uh, and it uh, contains a lot of uh, the bug fixes that we develop for customers and performance improvements that we develop it with for our customers. We release it open source, so anyone and everyone is totally welcome to uh, use Percona Server uh, and uh, gain, gain from these uh, additional uh, high performance capabilities that we build into the product. We also have a clustered version of Percona Server called Percona XRDB Cluster. Um, in, in the OpenStack community, the word Galera is pretty popular for clusters, and so we use Galera uh, as the clustering mechanism. Uh, of our um, what we call PXC product, uh, and uh, it, it's becoming quite popular among OpenStack users. Um, so both of those are 100% compatible with Oracle MySQL. But we also have tools that we developed 
Uh, one is Procona Extra Backup, which is uh, open source uh, hot backup solution to do physical backups for MySQL. Uh, and then uh, Procona Toolkit, uh, which is a DBA's best friend. Um, it makes doing common and tedious and sometimes risky tasks uh, for your, to your MySQL database. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, but also uh, on the risky side of things, it has checks and balances to make sure you know what you're doing. Uh, so all of the software is available from Percona.com. We encourage you to go check it out, try it out, use it, uh, and definitely give us feedback. Um, so I mentioned services. We start with consulting. Uh, we also do support uh, for people that just need help. They're a DBA and they need help and advice. Uh, and then managed services is on the other end of that where we can be your DBA. You can outsource that to us. Uh, and then Tom's focus on the community. So we interact with the community in various ways. Um, definitely in events. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Propona Live series of events that we hold uh, in uh, London and Santa Clara, um, California. Um, and that's a great thing for the MySQL community. Uh, and this is definitely a user focused event. Um, Perkona University is another type of uh, event that we hold. Uh, these are uh, uh, events that happen at different times throughout the year in different geographies around the world. Uh, we're planning a couple for February, and if you follow our, our blog, you definitely will see uh, updates about those events soon. Uh, these are day-long events that uh, are um, uh, uh, really great uh, uh, series of presentations from various speakers, either from Percona or from companies that we work with in related technologies. OpenStack Live is another event that uh, we'll talk about a little later um, that we're building off of our Percona Live Foundation in a user-focused event to, uh, as, I said, as I said earlier, build bridges between MySQL and OpenStack, uh, but also extend um, uh, the outreach to the OpenStack community uh, to have a, a forum for people to learn, gather, uh, and, uh, and grow um, their uh, knowledge and use of OpenStack. Um, we have the MySQL Performance Blog, which is a great community resource. Uh, just Procona.com slash blog. And then interacting with related communities. So this is something that Tom is always on the lookout uh, for. How can we help in other communities that somehow interact with MySQL? And uh, it, that's a lot of other communities from Drupal to OpenStack to uh, Hadoop and, and many, many other communities that we are reaching out to. Uh, so these are kind of the three core areas that Percona has been uh, working on um, uh, uh, since, since we were founded in 2006. But you, you may be wondering, so why is Percona really getting involved with OpenStack? And I alluded to uh, earlier in the agenda talking about the MySQL core of OpenStack, and that's really uh, uh, one of the three reasons is MySQL is a, uh, powers most of the core services of OpenStack. Uh, they're highly dependent on MySQL. And uh, you can see that in the chart on the right. Um, so this is from the most recent OpenStack user survey uh, in last November shared at the uh, Paris Summit that um, there are options that people have for databases to uh, 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 use as the core of their OpenStack clouds uh, for all the different services to store the data that they need to operate. Um, there are choices. Uh, but MySQL or some flavor of MySQL is far and away uh, the, the preferred choice for proof of concept, dev, and QA, and production deployments of OpenStack. Um, so that's one of the reasons why uh, Percona is getting well with, with OpenStack. Um, MySQL is also one of the primary use cases for uh, today for guest nodes in cloud infrastructure. Uh, whether you're using MySQL uh, on a guest VM, uh, or uh, you are uh, using a database as a service setup. Um, you know, these, they're, they're, the applications of today need databases, and frequently they're using MySQL as the back end. Um, and then finally, Percona has deep expertise in this area. Uh, so uh, we see OpenStack as a great project and a great community that can benefit from our expertise. And uh, not only the developer community, and being involved with the design summit, the OpenStack uh, uh, summit, uh, but also the end user community. And as the OpenStack community is shifting towards a focus on operations in the last 
12 to 18 months, um, we are really reaching out to those operators that are growing their infrastructure and testing things out uh, with how uh, we can uh, understand what's happening with MySQL and help them make it better. Uh, so, um, from uh, and I mentioned the Design Summit. So, Percona has actually been getting involved with OpenStack community uh, in various ways uh, from an engineering standpoint. Uh, we st actually started uh, even a few years ago. Uh, and with our contributions. Uh, and while we, we really haven't contributed a lot of code directly to OpenStack services, uh, we've ma made significant improvements to the MySQL story that have helped uh, build what DBAS has become uh, today and where, where it's going to go in the future. When I'm talking about DBAS, I'm talking about Trove. And so I'm going to hand it off to George to share uh, a little bit about what we've been doing uh, uh, the issues we uh, identified with running MySQL on the cloud uh, as guest databases, and how we've been working with HP uh, over the years to uh, sure up those uh, problems that we uh, identified with, with those use cases. Uh, so, um, George, I'll move the slide for you. Um, tell me when. <laughs> hey, Matt. Um, Hello all. Uh, this is George Lorch. I'm, as Matt uh, mentioned earlier, I'm uh, with uh, Percona, a software developer. Um, I've been working with uh, the Trove and OpenStack community now for, well, pretty directly for the last six months to a year, and then a little bit more indirectly for probably the last two years. <clears throat> and so today, we're going to go over a little bit of uh, what some of the work that we've done at Percona within Percona Server and Percona Extra Backup. Uh, to help make uh, management and owning uh, of a, a database as a service as an operator a little bit easier. Um, and, uh, and just in general, some of the challenges and issues that we were faced with when uh, trying to get Red Dwarf, which was, for those of you that have been around for a while, is the old, uh, old code names for the project. Um, yeah, Matt, can you go ahead and bump the slide up once? Sure. Okay, so the, one of the first things that uh, we encountered, uh, we were working with uh, HP back in the early days of Red Dwarf, and uh, it came about that we really needed to have a, uh, a special user um, for uh, what? Oh, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, we needed it. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, was that me or was that you? Um, there, there came about the need for to have a, a special, like an agent user or something that can actually access the hosted instance of your uh, uh, of your your database server to do different things, like uh, maybe manually set up replication or uh, be able to execute backups and things like that. The problem was was that user is exposed. So if your clients or customers uh, or users of these instances have uh, root access, they could see what this user is doing. They could potentially delete the user and actually uh, eliminate your ability to manage the server um, and other things like that. The problem is, is by just giving you, having your uh, deployment <coughs> use a regular user, um, you now also kind of have this liability in that anybody in your environment that ha that knows of this user can actually log into the database and access your customers or clients' data. Uh, currently, within Trove, that still exists. Um, there are some things in place where the user's got some restrictive permissions in that, but it's still, in, it, it's still an interesting issue that they have yet to really solve. Uh, so we got together with HP and we came up with this idea of let's create a, a very special user um, that we can control very, very specifically outside of MySQL, what its rights are, what it has access to, what it can and can't do. And this is called a utility user. There are a number of different um, options that you can use to configure this user to set up its username, its password, uh, and it, whatever uh, schemas it might have access to, as well as what rights it might have. And again, the per and so the purpose of this user within Helion is effectively to be able to do things like do password resets if somebody forgets a root password on users, uh, to perform backups, to set up replication, and things like that. But this user is now ex very limited in that it does not have access to the customer's schemas. So it cannot access any of, their, any of the, your client data at all. Um, so it kind of eliminates that liability. 
Uh, currently, this is only used by HP Helion and other customers outside, but it is not baked into Trove yet uh, because this is specific to Percona server. So uh, we're actually we're working with the Trove community um, to try and get this. <laughs> sorry, my cat. <laughs> we're trying. We're working with the Trove community to actually try and uh, get this exposed, so that way somebody that is using Percona server within their um, uh, within their Trove deployment instances, they can actually make use of this feature. So uh, Matt, if you want to move on to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> For everybody listening out there, that's my cat who's crying to get into the basement, and uh, he just decides to do this right at the critical time in the, while we're giving this presentation. <laughs> so uh, another thing that, that we've um, that we ran into is, again, is MySQL, when it was originally designed, was never really designed to be contained or confined within an environment such as a, a hosted environment. So it really didn't have any, any, many ways to, to keep people from setting values to unrealistic, value, to unrealistic or unusable ranges. Um, it currently does have one uh, feature. It's called an options modifier. But this wasn't really fully baked in the upstream version. They, they just had very few things that you could do. Uh, and one of them was to set a maximum on a value. And as you see in the slide, say, if you wanted to set a maximum value for a uh, query cache size, you would specify this in, a con in your MyConf or on a com command line. Um, and now a connected client could no longer uh, set that value any larger than that. Then that's all well and good. But the problem is, is that's the only useful thing that, is, that exists in upstream for constraining uh, your options and keeping your dynamic options from being set to unrealistic ranges by your end users. So we extended that functionality to add the ability to apply a minimum, a hidden, and read-only flags as well. So now, uh, as an operator, you can restrict uh, pretty, pretty thoroughly all of the dynamic options uh, that a client could set, and you can actually even hide some if you wish, if they're uh, potentially exposing some things about your infrastructure, such as paths or, or whatever. Um, this can, you can actually use this if you're using Percona Server in your uh, hosted images right now, uh, just because this is, uh, these are only comp file options. There's no coding changes needed to be made within the, the Trove uh, data set. And it is uh, currently being used, uh, as far as I know, uh, by uh, HP and their Helion cloud offering, and I think some of the other uh, cloud operators that provide per, uh, Percona server as an option, they use some of these as well. Um, next slide, Matt. Uh, along those same lines, again, is uh, the ability to enforce a storage engine. Um, in many cases, as an operator, you're selling a product, or if you're in an enterprise, you're putting a product out there where you're kind of guaranteeing a bit of data integrity. And if you're doing that, you're not using, you don't want your customer using my ISAM because it's just not, uh, as, as my CTO likes to say, um, if you love your data, don't use my ISAM. Um, so as an operator, if you want to sort of limit your liability there. If, uh, say, say somebody's using my ISAM, they've got a running instance, active data, and then they go and just kill the instance, well, and, and then restart it. Uh, guess what? You might have some corruption. Now you have to worry about trying to fix it. And as an operator, you now are kind of on the hook for having to perform that, uh, that operation. So we've added an option now that allows you to enforce the use of a specific storage engine. If somebody tries to create a table that is not uh, this particular engine, it will uh, either give you an error or it will silently switch the engine on you depending on what the, the current SQL mode is, um, and, and life goes on. It basically prevents a client from ever creating uh, a table that is not of the defined engine type. Now there are some system tables in MySQL that are like the user tables and all that that currently are my ISAM, and those will, would remain as my ISAM. And, uh, and are kind of ignored by this option, but uh, but otherwise any other user tables would be used would be set as this. Uh, this again can be used in Trove today if you're using Percona Server. You can uh, just it's just a, a config file option, so setting that in your images and uh, you're good to go. Uh, okay, next slide, Matt. So there's some other things going on in there too. With if you're again if you're providing in a uh, 
providing the service, you're, you've got some different uh, access restrictions with Trove. You can allow, with Trove, you actually can allow your end users to have SSH access into the box, but more often than not, that is not the case. Um, and as far as the Trove best practice is concerned, that is considered uh, a bad practice is to allow people to have SSH access into the box. So with that, there are still options, there are still uh, things that uh, users can do such as load data in file and select an out file that might actually try to go out and do other things on the file system that you don't necessarily want them to be able to do because it makes no sense. So uh, my, uh, upstream MySQL already has an option that allows you to limit the location where some of these operations can take place called the secure file proof. But it didn't have a way to actually completely disable these. We extended that a little bit. So now with the, you could just specify uh, your secu uh, secure file proof um, with no path and that will actually completely turn off the customer's ability to do load data in file and select an out file. Uh, a note on that, though, is that there is a load data in load. Uh, I forget the exact syntax. It's load local data in file. I think where you can load from your client, your currently connected client, across through the MySQL protocol client protocol to the server. That is still uh, functional. You can still do that. And this is mainly just to try to block uh, in and out file access to the. Uh, file system of the MySQL instance. And again, you can use this in Percona Server today in Trove. Um, it's just another config file option. And uh, as, again, as far as I know, this is being used fairly widely around uh, through most deployers that are using, uh, that are using Percona Server. Um, another thing with MySQL is with the log files. And uh, just about anybody that's run a MySQL instance it, somewhere in their history has hit uh, an out of space issue because they turned on a slow log or binary log, it didn't set the size limits and they ran out of space. Um, so upstream has uh, got the ability to limit the binary log file size, but it's limited to a single file. And it actually has no ability to limit the slow log size. Uh, we've added some options to the binary log file. So now not only can you limit the size, but we've implemented a binary log rotation. So you can have multiple files of a fixed size. Uh, that functionality we copied to the slow log as well. So now with the slow log, you can enable your slow log for debugging or monitoring purposes, um, but you can set an individual file size and have it rotated around so you can use, a, say, a secondary script or something to copy them off if you need to. Um, this is available in Percona Server. They're just, again, they're just uh, my conf options, um, and you can use it today. It's, it's the, uh, actually, all of these features that I've mentioned and continue to mention so far, are, they are available in Percona Server 5.5 and 5.6, as well as Percona Extra DB Cluster. Um, and that they've actually been baked in now, I think, for at least a, a year or more. Uh, okay, Matt, next slide. So if you use the combination of Percona Server with Percona Extra Backup, um, which Percona Extra Backup is one of the default choices within Trove today for performing um, physical backups, uh, you actually can get some cool side effects um, that you wouldn't normally be able to get if you were just using upstream MySQL and MariaDB. Uh, one of the things <coughs> is uh, for incremental backups, Percona Server has uh, an extra backup have uh, combined functionality called change page tracking, where what Percona Server will do is it will actually note in a bitmap file what pages have actually been changed and written to disk. Um, and when extra backup runs to go do uh, an incremental backup, it will just use this file to, to see what pages it needs to actually export uh, from INODB out of the server rather than doing a complete flat uh, scan of all pages, which is the, basically the way it ha would have to otherwise do an incremental backup because it needs to know, hey, has this page changed since this past point in time? Um, and that's in, you can enable that in Percona Server with just a simple option that turns it on. And when you run uh, Percona Extra Backup with an incremental, it automatically detects that uh, option and figures out it pretty much knows uh, if you're doing a backup, uh, an incremental, it knows what the LSN is, which is the, you know, the sequence number from the previous backup, so it knows where it needs to start uh, picking up these change pages, and it just works automatically at that point. Uh, another new feature, and this is actually pretty exciting, it's, it's big enough that um, even Oracle is considering uh, taking this feature uh, into upstream 5.7. 
it, which is a lightweight backup locks. So currently uh, in, say, uh, with MySQL 5.5 or 5.6 or Percona Server 5.5, when we're doing a backup, there's reach, we reach a point in time where we need to um, secure the uh, actual LSN coordinates that are in all the log files. We need to, know, we need to have basically a static snapshot at, uh, at, uh, at, um, with a, within a small window. So we use uh, flush tables with read lock. And uh, for anybody that is familiar with MySQL that knows what that does, it effectively stops your server from processing for from processing any new uh, data updates, um, DDL, and other things while that lock is held. It's it's a pretty aggressive lock, um, and not only is it a lock, but it also again it, by its very name, flush tables. It purges the in-memory um, uh, table cache and forces it to be reloaded from disk at, or recached effectively as the server goes on. Uh, no, it not, doesn't flush the buffer pool, but it's just the, just the in-memory table cache. So this is all way overkill for what backup needs. So we've introduced a new locking mechanism within Percona Server that extra backup automatically detects if the functionality is there. And it's a much more lighter weight backup that will only lock ex absolutely what's necessary for doing the backup. Um, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, and takes, it, it, it takes much less of a toll on a, server, on a, on a running server. Um, through the benchmarks that we've done with it, uh, when you execute a flush table, you can see noticeably uh, a noticeable drop in, in server throughput while the lock is held. Whereas with this backup, basically the only thing it really blocks is DDL statements and updates to non-transactional tables, such as my ISM. So if you're, it, it, it's enabled by default. In, there's really no way to turn it off. So if you're using Percona Server with Percona Extra Backup 2.2 series, um, it's just going to work. Um, you don't need to do anything extra. So if you're using Trove today uh, and you're preparing your images with these versioned products, uh, you get this feature automatically. So it's, it's, kinda, it's a, just a nice uh, gimme. You don't have to do anything for it. <laughs> uh, Matt, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, and just also mention this, these are great features that uh, will really benefit operators uh, and a more efficient use of uh, storage and uh, reduce time it takes to backup and help their customers' applications stay up more frequently when they're doing backups. So, yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's. This was this feature was a pretty big deal for us, um, and the surprising thing was actually how relatively easy it was in its implementation and design once uh, we sat down and started thinking about it. Um, and as I said, it's, it's an exciting enough feature that even uh, Oracle, it, it's raised some eyebrows there that they are considering uh, importing it uh, or taking our patches uh, up into 5.7 and even using it within the Oracle um, Enter uh, MySQL Enterprise Backup. Cool. Cool. Um, let me see. I lost my window here. There we are. Okay, uh, moving along a little further into Percona Extra Backup was, uh, again, early on within the Red Dwarf development, I mean, it was, you know, became per fairly obvious that we need to offer some way of doing server backups. We don't want to just rely on image snapshots. You know, end users want their backups and they want to host them somewhere else. Um, say in a Swift object store or uh, even on maybe some of their own internal servers or if, you know there's there's a dozen ways to skin the cat but everybody wants the, you know they want their backup and it needed to be baked into the trove or uh, the, the database as a service of uh, uh, API itself so that way you didn't need to do manual scripting on your images to to make it happen so some things that uh, extra features that came out of uh, these early design discussions that we've implemented in Extra Backup is uh, we've got a, uh, a very nice uh, compression uh, algorithm built into Extra Backup, whereas without this, you would have to pipe your stream your output of Extra Backup to some through you know, TAR, uh, GZIP, or something like that, which is a very single pipeline type process. With an Extra Backup, you can execute uh, we use quick LZ, so it's lightweight compression, um, and execute your compression on individual data blocks in parallel within Extra Backup. So it, uh, it actually is a, a 
a very, very nice way of, uh, of doing compression rather than using an external utility. It uh, gives you a lot more speed, and, and, a bit, and the difference in the compression ratio is not that great. Um, also, uh, similar to compression is internal to extra backup is uh, we can do uh, parallel um, symmetric key encryption. Um, again, the data blocks can be, uh, will be, can be uh, encrypted in parallel, and encryption is a fairly number uh, CPU intensive um, process. Without this being done internally, you would, you would have to pipe, it, pipe your output of extra backup through a secondary encryption tool. Um, usually something based on GPG or something like that, and and it's a very again it's a very serial process. It's, there's no parallelization that takes place there, and it will just slow down your backup, um, which can affect going back to the backup locks if it's you're exporting data that's being uh, that needs to be underneath the the flush table with read lock that's any size. This slows that down, holds the lock longer. Um, and effectively harms your server's performance while it's operating. So by using the built-in encryption, you get uh, a lot of benefit from uh, the parallelization and uh, better speed. Um, we've also got some other features that allow you to um, just note and monitor what's going on backup-wise. There's a backup history table that we can cr create that will pretty much track any backup that is done um, it notes like, the start and stop LSNs and all, all the good bits of information that you would want to know about a backup and just tracks it in a nice history table um, that you can then use to go and uh, either perform another backup based on uh, like an incremental based on some of the information in that table um, or uh, use that as a kind of a guide if you ever have to do a restore as to how to rebuild what, what, which backup was based on which other backup and so on. So that's all baked into Percona Extra Backup right now <clears throat> and available for use, and, it actually, and it's sitting right there. Uh, Trove currently does not make use of any of this stuff, and again, we're working with the Trove community to uh, get some blueprints created so we can actually uh, ex somehow expose some of these options to an operator um, or allow them to uh, use it through some, config some hidden comp files or something. Uh, so coming soon uh, to Extra Backup is we're going to extend the encryption to allow an asymmetric public key type encryption um, rather than a, a fixed key or fixed symmetric key. So uh, this, again, uh, end users will appreciate this now that they no longer have to actually have a, the symmetric key on the actual device that's doing the encryption. They can just have the public key registered on the uh, on the instance, and then they maintain the private key. Um, and this is, and this next one is a big one: is this, is streaming backups directly into Swift. Um, this actually is a parallel streaming of backups into Swift uh, objects. Uh, we basically block, break up the backup into blocks, and we'll parallel in parallel upload it to a Swift object store and maintain a manifest. Uh, this is currently in alpha. Uh, Trove itself already does something similar to this, but it does it with a lot of scripting magic, and it is actually is a, it's a serial process. They're not doing anything in parallel, um, and there are issues where if there's any kind of latency or errors or whatever with Swift, it basically just uh, it just craps out and the entire backup is dead. You have to start all over again. Um, this this was a a real pain point for uh, earlier uh, Red Dwarf. Uh, users of, uh, such as HP with Helion and that, um, and they almost just gave up on it at one point. So we now have this natively uh, that will be uh, that is an external utility that comes with uh, Percona Extra Backup. You'll pipe your output of Extra Backup into this utility, and it does all the magic for you. Um, and it's bidirectional, so it will also be able to go read from Swift as well and pull a backup back out and reconstruct it into a state that you can use it to uh, restore a database. Um, and that is pretty much it for me, Matt, I think. Yeah, we've got third additional resources here. Um, the, uh, there's a link here on the slide. This was, uh, there was a longer or a larger presentation that I did at the uh, OpenStack Summit in Paris with uh, the pool from HP. Uh, he's one of their uh, project leads over the uh, Red Dwarf project, and then now uh, he was a leading contributor to Trove up until recently. Um, we uh, co co-presented this, and it was a uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Actually, we had a good time doing it, and lots of good information. Um, yeah, if you'd uh, like to learn more about these, 
if you would like to learn more about uh, these uh, uh, things that George has been sharing, uh, I encourage you to watch that uh, YouTube video. It's linked here, and uh, I believe I said at the uh, beginning of the presentation that um, there's a link to uh, for you to get a copy of this presentation um, at the end of this presentation, <laughs> and uh, you can click on this uh, link in the in the deck, and it'll jump you right to the uh, YouTube video. This is the title of the presentation. If you want to try searching it for it for yourself. So, yeah, and uh, all of all of these options, uh, all the server options and features that are Percona specific that I mentioned um, are all very thoroughly documented with actual use uh, kind of use papers if there or use cases if it's needed um, on our uh, Percona website under our, ser our server and um, extra backup documentation. So it, it fully explains everything there, how to use it, what side effects there might be, and et cetera, et cetera. Great, excellent. Thank you, George. So the next topic that uh, we're going to uh, discuss is the benchmarking that we've been doing of the MySQL Core of OpenStack, and I shared earlier about um, uh, you know, as part of you know, why we're focusing on OpenStack is because MySQL uh, really sits at the core of uh, OpenStack. It's dependent on uh, by many of the services of OpenStack, Nova, Neutron, um, rely heavily on MySQL. Uh, so um, that's why we want to dig into this benchmarking and understand uh, uh, where can uh, OpenStack be improved uh, and what do operators need to know about operating their uh, OpenStack infrastructure uh, and optimizing the, the MySQL core uh, for higher performance. Um, so uh, this is an effort for the Paris Summit. Uh, we uh, partnered up with Mirantis, uh to do an extensive benchmarking exercise. Uh, and uh, in it, we really focused on assessing the performance of the database in order to identify the bottlenecks. Uh, so this was uh, uh, Peter Boros from Percona. He's one of our lead consultants. Uh, he worked with Jay Pipes, uh, who's one of Branton's uh, head engineers, uh, and they presented on this topic. And I'm just going to cover the high points, uh, but um, I will definitely leave some things out. Uh, and not do the presentation justice. So I, I also will include a link to the presentation um, where you can watch it yourself, uh, see a lot of uh, the low-level details that Peter and uh, Jay um, uh, investigated and, and, and shared with the audience in Paris. Um, but I'll just kind of share, these were their objectives. So they wanted to examine the, the database communication uh, uh, and load in an open stack environment. And so um, uh, the second one is identifying those bottlenecks. What are those uh, ch uh, bottlenecks of the various levels of, of concurrency? And then understand, well, understanding the, just the query load, uh, uh, placing it the database, and then um, uh, you dig into the identify some of the reasons why. Um, and um, as I said, they presented all this in Paris. This is actually going to be an ongoing thing that they're doing. Uh, so I expect them to submit a proposal for uh, the next summit in Vancouver with an update on uh, their investigation. Uh, plus, they are also feeding back information to the relevant teams. So if there's things that Nova, Neutron, and anyone else can learn about uh, how um, things might be improved, um, Peter and Jay are actively doing that uh, to help the community. So uh, just to share some details about their setup. Um, they, first of all, were running uh, unmodified OpenStack Ice House um, and then unmodified uh, Percona ExtraDB cluster. Uh, so that was the MySQL flavor that they were using. Um, they used pretty robust instances, and they started with uh, an initial setup of about seven, uh, of seven AWS instances. Uh, so you can see the breakdown here between the controller computes uh, PXC, that's the database for kind of extra DB cluster. And then Rally is the tool that they used um, that, uh, to, to do the benchmarking. Peter Boris is a big fan of Rally, and he was very impressed uh, with his capabilities. Uh, but um, they went to, uh, decided to uh, update the infrastructure, uh, the testing infrastructure, went up to 16 instances. Uh, and really the big change was the compute worker nodes. So what they found was the Nova Compute daemon is single-threaded, and they, I think they knew this going into it. But what happens is um, 
they they wanted to get around that, and so they spread the the work across um, the different compute nodes. Um, but also, as part of that, um, each compute node uh, in the database is one row on a table, so they wanted to avoid hot rows and again kind of spread it out uh, a little more. Um, they kind of felt that this was a little more realistic uh, of a uh, enterprise setup, and that matched the benchmarking test that they were going to do um, uh, a little later. So um, you can see kind of by the description of the instances, they're pretty big, pretty beefy instances uh, uh, with the, uh, the C3s uh, there. So, so now what kind of tests did they do? So the first test that they did was let's just boot 10,000 servers. Uh, and see what happens. And what they saw was that there was some increase in response time, um, and they saw some errors. Um, and, and there's a, an error that has been coming up every so often uh, that uh, it looks like a deadlock, but it's actually uh, something related to Galera and the certification process that Galera does to uh, and the synchronization across of the data updates across different nodes. Um, so they found some errors, which were these Galera certification timeouts. Uh, but they really found that the database was not the bottleneck in this scenario um, of just booting 10,000 servers and letting them run. But what they then did is they um, to, to add in the scenario of okay, some infrastructures are going to have some nodes that are going to always be running. Or some instances they're always going to be running, um, but there's going to be another batch of instances that are created and deleted, and created and deleted, and created and deleted. Uh, and so they did another test of adding uh, a scenario of booting another 5,000 uh, more uh, server instances and then deleting them. Um, so uh, the results were there um, were pretty interesting, um, and that. Uh, um, they found that uh, writing to uh, across several nodes significantly improves the performance, uh, and so um, th that kind of gets back to the uh, ten compute nodes from the previous slide. Um, they found that some services, some OpenStack services um, like Nova, um, would if they hit this certification timeout in ProConnection DB cluster when doing a uh, update, um, uh, that uh, they would. Rather than just report an error and stop, some of the services uh, would retry, which is great. Uh, but some of the services really didn't. Uh, so uh, Jay Pikes talked about Nova has this um, uh, option to retry on deadlock, uh, which uh, sounds like it's a, it's, it's a nice option. But some of the services in OpenStack don't have this, and so that's something to be aware of. Um, uh, but what they also found was these timeouts probably won't come up that frequently in production, and maybe it might be a false positive. I think it's, it's something that they are uh, investigating further, uh, and uh, Peter and Jay have been writing blog posts about it um, and, and talking with the, the other uh, uh, OpenStack uh, project uh, teams. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it's something to learn more about because it potentially could cause problems uh, in uh, large-scale production uh, environments. Um, so those are some of the uh, results uh, that they saw from the low test, and I'll share some more results. Um, George, do you have anything to share uh, about uh, these low tests that you were aware of? Um, no, not really. Actually, Peter did most of that work with Jay, um, and, I, and the, the results were in line with everything that we already kind of knew about the way things should behave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, and when I talk about that uh, Galera certification timeout, um, part of uh, the cause was this uh, use of a select for update. Uh, and if you follow some of the uh, OpenStack mailing lists, you might have seen some uh, long threads about um, this issue, select for update, um, that uh, it, it gets masks at masks, masks as a deadlock error, uh, but it could potentially cause some uh, some problems for large scale production uh, deployments. Um, so um, I, I encourage you to, and I, and I link to it in the deck, to read Peter Boros's blog post on the topic, watch the presentation with Jay uh, from Morantis uh, just to get more information there. 
they found that they got more uh, better performance when they combined um, the network and the queue uh, node, um, and also got great results from using PT Query Digest, which is a part of the Percona Toolkit suite. Um, when I'm part of Percona's open source software, it's a really powerful way to analyze the results of these workloads. Um, it's got a capability to do these options, which filter the output uh, and allow you to look for various things and expose problematic queries, um, the most problematic queries for different uh, use cases. Uh, so they focused on, in the presentation, um, I encourage you to, uh, to watch it, they focused on slowest transactions, uh, large transactions, and it's these large transactions that can often cause stalls in Galera that are waiting for the largest transaction to uh, to commit. And so it looks like slave lag, but it's a little different. So um, um, that's uh, there. Um, and more lessons learned. Again, as they went to this uh, larger infrastructure, they found database is not really the bottleneck. Um, the controller node uh, and the, its functions, it's, those were saturated far earlier. Uh, and maxed up the CPU. When they but when they're looking at the database node, there really wasn't a whole lot of stress on the database. So um, they want to do some more testing, and they will do more testing uh, to investigate why, and then see if they can create a scenario, a, a real real scenario that does put uh, stress on uh, on the database. Um, they uh, found that some uh, services were not as efficient in how they utilized the database, and so there's likely many opportunities for optimizations uh, if for your production cloud. Um, they, there's, uh, for example, indexes could be, uh, could be used more efficiently uh, in better ways uh, to help with uh, certain queries that took a significant amount of time. Um, and again, this is something though they're going to continue to investigate um, and uh, that they're and feeding back information to the. Uh, OpenStack teams uh, in the form of patches, advice, uh, conversations uh, to uh, help make OpenStack better. So um, some additional resources uh, in the deck I linked to their video presentation. We also have some Ansible playbooks. So if people want to try these tests on their own, um, they're public on GitHub. Uh, they're linked in the presentation, uh, and Peter and Jay are updating those. Um, and then a couple of blog posts I linked to um, Peter's post about uh, the uh, select uh, for update issue, uh, and then Jay's uh, post about uh, uh, locking in Nova uh, was a really great post. Um, so uh, finally, to kind of keep moving along, um, just want to talk about how we are supporting the OpenStack community um, as Percona. Um, so. Some efforts that we're working on right now, and George mentioned a few that we want to get um, in front of the Trove team around um, uh, extra backup and new capabilities there, but also Trove clustering. Um, it, it's a, 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 um, a next step from where Trove is today with single nodes, uh, and it's an important step. And uh, we're working with the Trove, uh, other Trove developers, to uh, help move this forward. Uh, in the best way possible. Uh, part of it is, is a lot of planning up front to make sure you're taking the right approach, uh, and and so we're helping there as we can. Anything to add there, George? Uh, no, it's just, we're, we're yeah we're just working on the uh, clustering API as uh, Matt mentioned, and uh, yeah the idea with that is to allow uh, an operator to actually uh, present a uh, MySQL cluster to uh, to an end user as a choice for them to use. <coughs> There are various issues with that right now um, um, uh, in regards to uh, being able to deploy a cluster properly across uh, availability zones and then even across geographic uh, distributed locations um, because some of that stuff really uh, that, that is present in the core of OpenStack hasn't actually been implemented yet within Trove. So um, as that stuff rolls out, uh, you'll be able to do a pretty pretty cool and pretty sophisticated uh, clustering deployments uh, with Trove um, coming soon, um, hopefully within the yeah. next cycle or two. Yeah, definitely in the planning stages right now, and, and it's important to plan, do a good job planning on these things up front, um, especially with all the dependencies across the different OpenStack services. Um, we are also working with the docs team to update the HA guide. Um, and that's the high availability guide that uh, 
uh, we want to really focus and improve the MySQL side of things uh, and, and educate people uh, through the open, the open uh, documentation that's out there. Uh, but also others are interested in updating other components of the HA guide. Um, the, uh, we were publishing uh, OpenStack related topics on our MySQL performance blog. And uh, I encourage you to uh, check that. You can filter it by uh, the tag OpenStack. Uh, and then it's also republished on OpenStack Planet uh, if you follow that site. Uh, so you can get the latest info about Percona and OpenStack. Uh, and then I mentioned Peter uh, Boros's and Jay Pike's Ansible playbooks. Uh, so those are good resources to learn um, about some of the um, testing that and benchmarking that uh, Peter and Jay are doing. Um, so we also, and I mentioned OpenStack Live uh, on the event side of things earlier. Um, we are uh, this is another way that we're supporting the OpenStack community. Um, this event it really focuses on real world use cases of OpenStack. It was Part of our mission with this event was uh, it, it's going to. We're known for Percona Live, which is a very user-focused conference. We want OpenStack Live to be just the same thing—a very user-focused uh, event. Uh, and so, uh, though there will be some database-related topics like Trove, we also designed it to span across all of OpenStack. Uh, so, um, user focus spans all of OpenStack. It's going to be a great event. Um, we ha will have hands-on tutorials. Uh, covering a variety of OpenStack uh, services like Trove, Barbican, Ceph, Neutron, and, and others. Um, and you know, bring your laptop, get ready to um, uh, make sure it's, it's fully charged. <laughs> we'll have power. Um, but uh, uh, it, you know, very hands-on tutorials. And then sessions and keynotes uh, on uh, Rally, again, uh, a little more on Trove, uh, and real-world stories from uh, enterprise users. Time Warner is, is giving a presentation, and there will be others. Uh, presenting about um, their uh, experience using uh, OpenStack. Uh, so the event is April 13th to the 14th in Santa Clara, uh, just a few months away. Early bird registration ends very soon, so um, you know, I would encourage you to, to register now and join us in April. Um, Tom, anything else to add here before we do the? Uh, uh, oh, I'll just add. We are also going to give away one free full conference pass to an attendee of this event. Uh, so if you're listening to my voice right now, uh, you're eligible to win one of those passes, uh, and we'll be in touch with you after uh, this conference, uh, uh, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, with uh, whether you uh, with whether you won. So, um, Tom, anything else to add there? Uh, just that um, we'll be we'll, we'll email all the links and uh, the DAC and everything to everybody who attended, uh, along with the um, winner of the uh, OpenSec uh, pass. I know it's, uh, we're, on, we're on top of the hour, so I'll yes. um, wrap you up yes. in a few minutes. Perfect, perfect cool. guys. This, this uh, is really a – sorry, go ahead. I didn't want to yeah, interrupt I just you. Want to thank you, Raphael. I uh, really appreciate it, and the Cloud Online Meetup group for this chance to present uh, and talk about some of the database challenges that exist with OpenStack and what Percona is doing uh, from an engineering and community standpoint to uh, uh, an education standpoint to address those so more users can achieve higher performance. Uh, but these, these are emails and um, a link to the deck, and, and as Tom said, you'll get an email up from us also. So, Raphael, to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, guys, for this awesome presentation. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, the um, slides as well as the recorded um, online meetup are going to be available shortly. And um, Pergona is sponsoring us, the Cloud Online Meetup, so expect further sessions. Uh, we'll certainly dwell into the to today's topics as well as into the upcoming OpenStack Live event. And uh, with that, again, thank you, everybody.